Hello everyone, welcome to the 19th lecture of uh, the NPTEL course on Scalable Data Science. I am uh, Professor Shorang Shubhattacharya from Computer Science Department in IIT Kharagpur and today we are going to discuss about Spark. So, already we have discussed uh, what is big data, we have discussed what is Hadoop which is a open source system for big data, uh, we have discussed what is MapReduce and the MapReduce programming paradigm, we have seen some MapReduce programs and we have also seen uh, the implementation details of the MapReduce paradigm, how uh, MapReduce can be implemented such that it can really work in a distributed setting on a very large data. So, today we are going to uh, discuss uh, or rather in this series of lectures we are going to discuss about Spark. Uh, so, to begin with we are going to discuss uh, a bit about the programming language Scala uh, which is uh, functional programming language. So, uh, so one, there are two main reasons for discussing uh, this programming language Scala. The first reason is that uh, Spark was itself developed in Scala and uh, even now the Scala is the most widely used platform for writing programs for uh, Spark uh, or yeah. And secondly, uh, in general the lot of these distributed computation paradigms including Spark and MapReduced are actually inspired by uh, functional programming paradigm which is an uh, which is an existing programming paradigm. So, uh, so Spark is very uh, strongly integrated with the functional programming language Scala and hence understanding the constructs of Scala will also help us understand the constructs of uh, Spark better. So, uh, we will cover uh, about the var and the val. So, we will not cover all aspects of Scala, we will cover, cover only very limited uh, aspects of Scala namely var and val, then we will uh, cover classes and objects. Most importantly, uh, we will cover the notion of functions and higher order functions which are uh, very, very important and are directly borrowed and then generalized and distributed uh, in the Spark uh, programming paradigm. And also we will discuss about lists which are also borrowed in the Spark programming paradigm for a something like a distributed list. Okay. So, as discussed earlier uh, Scala is both functional and object oriented uh, programming language. So, basically every value in Scala is an object. So, I am assuming that you are familiar with what is object oriented programming and so every value in Scala is an object and moreover every function is a value and hence an object including the methods which are part of objects. Okay. So, Scala was designed on top of Java. So, when you write the uh, when you see the programming construct you will see a lot of uh, derivatives from the Java and uh, another uh, important piece of information is that Scala is actually a statically typed language just like Java. So, every variable has a type but it can do a local type inference. So, we will see. So, you do not always have to specify the type. So, so first we discuss about this var and val. So, uh, var uh, you can use var keyword to declare variables. So, Scala has the concept of variables and constants. So, for example, in this case as you can see the var x defines a variable x. So, at a later point in time in the program you can say x plus equal to 4 or x is equal to 5 or something and it will work. This is because uh, uh, x is a variable. 
However, you can also use this keyword val which is used to declare values or uh, constants. So, in Java these are called const variable or constant variables which are uh, so for example, if you say y is equal to 3 and then if you try to do y plus equal to 4 uh, Scala will throw an error because you cannot change a constant. So, this brings the notion of immutability. So, there are certain variables which are immutable. Uh, so, uh, you notice that uh, uh, that we have not specified any type. So, the type will be inferred. So, for example, in this case uh, you uh, the type of x will be taken as int because you have given x is equal to 3. So, later if you try to do x is equal to uh, let us say hello world it will give an error. Okay. Uh, of course, you can also explicitly mention the type like this. Okay. So, this is an example of a class definition in Scala. So, for example, we are trying to define the class point where uh, which has two, uh, two values one is x c uh, or rather two components and both are of type int and one is x c and one is y c and maybe these are storing the coordinates. And then this is the method which is uh, the method move which takes d x and d y as the input. So, these are maybe the amount by which you want the current point to move and then what it just computes the new x as x plus d x and also the new y as uh, y plus d y. So, and then it can uh, print things. So, this is just to get you familiar with the, uh, uh, the programming language or programming style of Scala. Now, uh, uh, once you define a class like we have defined, uh, you can define objects of this class. So, you can say uh, val c which is like a value of uh, from the class new counter and it can also be a parameterized class something like uh, string which is uh, the, the, the class itself is defined as a parameterized class okay? uh, and the new keyword would create a new object of this class. And then you can just uh, access members as you would do in Java. So, many of these constructs are just like Java and you can say print ln c dot size. In fact, you can use, so since uh, Scala programs run in Java virtual machines, you can use ma much of the uh, Java library also. Okay. Now, in functions is where the new thing starts. So, you can, the first definition is a standard definition of a function. So, you have the function name and then you have the argument. So, this is the argument, x is the argument and then you have the function body within the braces. Okay. The second uh, definition is a definition which is without braces. Okay. So, you can, uh, so here this is bar is the function name, okay. this y is the argument. So, whatever is within the bracket is the argument list, this is the return type of this function. So, you are say, saying that the function bar takes in an integer and returns another integer and then you are just, so you are just saying the return value is equal to y plus 42. So, as if it is just a value, uh, it is just a value, but it is actually not a value because now whenever you say bar and then you pass it a certain argument it will return, by, so, so let us say you add 10, then it will return 52. So, it will add 42 to it and return 52. Okay. And the lastly, of course, you can define functions which are, 
which have no argument no parameters also or no arguments also in which case of course, these are same as uh, defining constants. Okay. Uh, so, we have already discussed that uh, uh, functions are like values because it is a functional programming language. So, so, one way of defining a function literal is to use equal to greater than symbol. Okay. So, the, so, so, for example, if you say um, val foo equal to and then you write within bracket x. So, x is now the parameter of this function, then you write the symbol of function which is the equal to greater than symbol and then you write the body of the function. Okay. So, this defines the new function with the name foo. So, whenever you have to invoke this function you can just call foo with the parameter and then it will execute. So, for example, in this case it checks if uh, x modulo 2 is 0 then it returns x by 2 otherwise it returns 3 x plus 1. So, when you pass 7 it re returns 3 into 7 plus 1 which is 22. Okay. So, in general this is the a function literal. Okay. So, function literal is of this form that you have the parameter list followed by the uh, equal to greater than side uh, or is uh, equal to greater than uh, symbol followed by the function body. Okay. And then, so we will come to this uh, for each function in a minute. Okay. So, uh, so, now the advantage of this is that now you can for example, you can use pass around functions like as if they are values. So, you can for example, pass functions as parameters to other functions which you could earlier not do. Not only that, you can define functions which take in as one of their parameters other functions. Okay. So, so for example, uh, take this example. So, uh, so, so, so uh, we have already uh, said that uh, you can define the function using this uh, equal to greater than sign. So, for example, this is one function where you have taken th uh, n arguments and uh, you have given a certain return or you can take just one argument and uh, take a return and so on and so forth. So, let us take this example. So, in this example the first statement is defining a function do twice. Okay. So, this function takes in as the first argument a function. So, this first argument for this function is another function. Okay. So, what we are giving here is just the prototype of this function. So, basically this function f takes in one integer and returns one integer and that happens to, the to be the first argument of this do twice function and the second argument is just an integer okay. and then the return value for this do twice function is that you apply this f function twice to this argument n which is also an argument to this function and return the value. So, uh, so for example, now you define another function let us say collats which takes in one integer as an argument and returns another integer as an argument. So, if the integer is an even number then it returns n by 2 else it returns 3 into n plus 1. Okay. So, now if you uh, if you pass this collats function to do twice. So, you call the do twice function with collats and the argument 7. So, according to this definition it uh, 
basically applies this function two times. Okay, so the function collides function two times. So the first time, as we all know, the output is twenty-two. Now, second time when it applies, it knows that it is a even number, so it just returns n by two. So hence, the final output is eleven. Okay. Uh, Similarly, you can pass another function literal. So instead of defining a function and then passing it to do twice, you can just define a function literal here, which is like uh, so. This is your function literal, which basically takes in a value a and then returns hundred and one times a. Okay, so this is your function. So this is the first argument, which is the function literal. Okay, and the second argument is of course three. So it will apply this hundred and one times a two times. So first it will uh, apply hundred and one times to a. So it will get three three hundred and three, and then again it will multiply this by hundred and one, and then it gets this result. Okay. Now we want to define. Two three types of functions. So for, so as we have seen now that you can understand that uh, this is something going towards map reduce where uh, where you basically have to pass functions. So before going into that, you can have two types of functions. The first is first type is called the lambdas, which are basically nameless functions which take in a value. So, so lambdas are nameless functions which have no side effects. Okay, so these are functions which have no side effects. So these are nameless functions which take in some arguments. It can take either one argument or more than one argument, and it returns a value, but doesn't need anything else. Okay, so this is the first type of function. Second type of functions is called What are called closures. So closures are functions which are sensitive on the context. So, for example, you can have uh, a variable y, okay, which is uh, y is equal to three, and then you can have a function g, okay, uh, which which is basically Taking in an argument x, your function g takes in an argument x, okay, and which is of type int, of course, and then it does y plus equal to one, and then returns x plus y. Okay, so this function not only takes in the arguments that it is passed, but also utilizes this variable y. Okay, so many functions do this. For example, uh, methods in a, for, of a class can dereference the local variables of that that class while taking in also the arguments. Okay, so uh, we will see uh, how uh, these are tackled, why these are important. Uh, but note that these functions can also be context sensitive. Okay, now. Uh, Okay, so we will uh, now go into uh, some functions. Uh, yeah. So before going into uh, functions, we want to define one more thing, which is called the lists. Okay. So lists are like arrays. Okay. So for so this is an example of a list. Okay. So and uh, you can also have uh, a, a, a list. Which is not populated, okay? In which case, uh, you have to give the type, of course. Uh, so, so, so lists uh, like strings. So these are arrays, but these are immutable arrays, okay? And so, so lists are like a. So what we think in the real world that these are list of values. Which you need to operate on, okay? So, uh, so, so for example, you can use. So there are many many functions which are defined on lists. Uh, 
for example, you can use a list uh, dot head to get the first entry of the list or you can use list dot tail to get the last element of the list. In general, you can get the ith element of list. However, you cannot do something like this that list dot i is equal to value okay, because it is immutable. Now, with lists, Scala defines some of these operations. So, the first operation is called the map operations. Okay. Now, these are also called higher order methods or higher order functions. From Scala point of view, uh, it is not much different than an existing function. However, from programmers point of view, these are higher order functions because they take in another function as an argument. So, what does uh, the map function do for example? So, the map function is a member function of the list class okay? and when you call so, let us say you define a list which is l l okay? and then you call the map function on the list and parameter to this map function is the double function. So, another way of writing the same thing is you call l l dot map and then as a parameter you just say double. Now, note that double is defined as a function here. Okay. So, what this will do is it will return another list where every element of the original list has been doubled. Okay. So, what map function is doing is it is being called on a list. So, it is the member function of a list. It takes in another function and then applies that function to every individual element in this list and returns the resulting list as a new list. Okay. So, this is what map function does. Similarly, you can have a filter function. Okay. So, the filter function uh, also works on elements, individual elements of a list. Okay. It takes in a function which basically uh, uh, it is a, a Boolean valued function on the type of element. So, note one thing that the value the type of the list. So, list is a parameterized type. So, your list you can have list of integers, you can have list of strings etcetera. Now, this double function must be of appropriate type such that if it is being called on a list of integers, it should take in uh, as argument an integer which was the case in this case and if it is being called on a list of strings it should take in as argument a string. Okay. So, otherwise there will be error thrown. Okay. Mm. Now, similarly here, um, so, so uh, the filter function takes in as an argument a function a boolean valued function. So, this function takes in, so the function that is to be supplied to the filter function has to be a function which returns either true or false as an uh, as a return value. And now, for the filter function simply returns a list for which the resulting elements evaluate to true according to the supplied function. Okay. So, for example, in this case, uh, if you call filter with underscore less than or equal to 5 or which is same as this. So, if you call uh, uh, so, uh, n and then uh, equal to greater than n less than 5, which basically means that it evaluates true when the argument is less than 5, otherwise false, then it will only select those which are less, those elements which are less than 5. Okay. So, there are many other higher order methods which one can check. Basically, these are uh, filter or not, uh, count, for all uh, exists, find and sort with. Okay. So, uh, you, can, you can check the Sc Scala reference for, uh, for all the higher order methods 
that uh, one can use. Okay. So, now uh, just to sum up, uh, so Scala is a functional programming language which allows you to treat functions as though they are, they are values. So, functions can be passed to other functions, functions can be uh, uh, pro, uh, part of a function and so on and so forth. Okay. And then you have higher order functions uh, which, uh, which uh, can operate on uh, these, uh, these uh, lower order, uh, which, which can take these uh, simple functions as input and then uh, do, uh, do a adaptive kind of computation based on the input function that is given. So, now we start discussing spark. So, uh, what is spark? So, spark is an in memory cluster computing platform for iterative and interactive applications. Okay? So, it is a open source Apache project which is available at this URL uh, uh, spark.apache.org and um, it is uh, free for download and uh, so anybody can use it. Okay. Um, so, so, a little bit of uh, background on Spark. So, Spark was uh, started in AMP lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, this was around 2012 uh, and, it, and then they came up uh, with this concept of what is called resilient distributed data sets. Okay? Uh, so, these are the main concept behind Spark. Uh, we will come to what they are and why they are so interesting. Okay? So, one of the advantages of Spark is that unlike Hadoop, which is mostly for data intensive computation, uh, Spark is a bit more flexible. So, it can be used for both data and computation in, uh, intensive computations. Okay. Uh, then just like Hadoop, uh, Spark is fault tolerant. Uh, it is uh, as I have already mentioned integrated with Scala. It has all the goodies that uh, Hadoop provides or all the good properties that Hadoop provides like strangler handling and uh, data locality and it is also very easy to use. Okay. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, we already have the background. So, the basic idea is that uh, we want to perform big data computation on a set of community clusters. So, so there are of course, many, many applications like in industry you can have web search you can have machine translation, you can have ad targeting. In research, you can have bioinformatics, NLP, climate simulation, etcetera. Okay. So, uh, now uh, typically uh, for uh, such data intensive computation, one tries to use the MapReduce framework. Okay. Uh, so, basically the understanding here is that can we use framework or the computation that MapReduce provides, but uh, make it more powerful for the programmer or in other words the programmer should be able to express a wider array of computations than what he or she could using MapReduce. So, what is the MapReduce uh, computation model? The MapReduce computation model is uh, uh, something like this that you have this uh, input which is basically the um, a stable storage. So, typically for the big data framework we will uh, people use uh, a distributed file system as the storage and then there are some mapper jobs which run and then there is a shuffling that goes on here and then there is a uh, there are some reducer jobs which run and then finally, you uh, write to some stable storage which is again a uh, typically a distributed storage. Okay. Now, the question is, so, so 
so why do we do this okay so one thing we have so we have seen the advantage or the benefits of this kind of map reduce framework so what are the benefits of uh, this so the first is that you have scalability and fault tolerance okay then the runtime can decide on everything it can decide on tasks uh, on the task scheduling it can automatically recover for from failures uh, and basically it can scale very well okay but the question is is this the only computation model for which we can have all this advantage okay so now uh, let us see what are the problems with this computation model okay so the problems with this computation model is that these two okay so first iterative algorithms are not very easily expressed in uh, hadoop map reduce so this is uh, so first of all you have to write multiple hadoop jobs in a loop in order to express an iterative computation which is as we have seen already very unwieldy secondly this will be very very slow because every time you write uh, you you your hadoop job or your map reduce job actually uh, takes as input data from some stable storage does the processing distributed processing and then writes data to a stable storage okay so it is a uh, uh, very inefficient uh, if you want to use some iterative algorithm and many of the algorithms are uh, in machine learning uh, for example are iterative algorithms okay uh, the other problem is when you have a lot of interactive tools okay so so hadoop was designed for batch processing so the processing was something like you have a certain amount of data and you want to extract some information out of that data uh, I, I, in a distributed and scalable manner so, uh, so you take the data as the input and run the map reduce job however what if you want to first extract a certain amount of information from the data and then you want to refine that so for example first you may want to see the minimum and the maximum uh, uh, temperatures for a particular country and then once you have found that out you you are the answer you were looking for was not there maybe you want to find the minimum and maximum temperature for a certain uh, uh, the cities of one particular country so the data that you are processing is the same okay but you now want a different set of output in that case you have to run a different map reduce job however as we shall see in spark you can do it much much faster so this is the interactive computation okay so we will see how uh, uh, we are able to achieve all this use in spark in the next lecture thank you